Well, thanks for taking a second to stop by with us today. I don't know if you're watching on Instagram or Facebook. I have no idea where this video is going to be. Hell, it could be on MySpace for all I know and uh, have one of those middies floating down. Did you have a MySpace profile, Matt? I did. It probably still exists somewhere out there in cyberspace, but couldn't tell you where. So mine had a MIDI of California Love by Tupac, and I had dollar signs when I learned how to HTML, had dollar signs floating down. Do you know no. if you had a MIDI on yours or That's, was it just stock? No, a stock, man. You had a baller page. Yeah, it was That's a baller awesome. page. So I'm, I'm here with Matt, Matt Dorito, Dorito or Dorito. Dorito? Yeah, Dorito. No, I like Dorito because Doritos, like I think of cheesy, cheesy chips. So it's going to be Dorito for today, but it is Dorito. It is Dorito, yeah. Um, in fact, like I bought a house here in uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana recently. Um, so I can spend more time here at Cabot working in the machine shop and everything. And on the entrance to my house, I got, I got like a custom doormat made that yeah. says the cool ranch, you know, like uh, cool ranch Doritos, it's a Dorito. it's a ranch style house. So it had to be the cool ranch. Nice. Well, there you go. That makes sense. And you've got your, uh, your Amazon driver. You guys are buddies. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> <laughs> unlikely friendship, but I guess I order a lot of stuff from Amazon, so. Yeah, well, before we get like too deep into this and people are like, I have no idea what the hell they're doing. Uh, we're here in Fort Wayne. If you can look down below, I don't know what you can see from the camera, but there's all the machinery here. This is where cabots are made. They start as a piece of bare steel and then they leave here as a fully functioning firearm made in the USA. And Matt here, in, a, in addition to being an awesome rock star, is a fantastic machinist. And what do you do? You manage the whole machine shop? Yeah, I, I don't like to use the word manage, but okay. just, uh, you know, make sure that our production is on schedule and stuff like that. Work with, you know, like taking all the pieces of the puzzle and making them work together to get as many guns out the door as as fast as we can while maintaining the quality that, we, that we're known for. So. Nice. And I think people will be surprised when they get here to see that, you know, we're making guns, but more than just like the gun shop, the, the, the gunsmithing section is probably what? A fifth of the space, the floor space that we have. The rest of it's a machine shop. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a, a bunch of guys all together that are assembling guns, mm -hmm. you know, very close quarters. And then really, including myself, just four of us that are actually running machines. Um, we've got uh, maybe like 15 machines out there, not including like some manual mills and, you know, lathe and stuff like that. But um yeah, it's, uh, we kind of like it that way, actually, because, you know, it's a, a handful of us that all know the process so intimately, like, yeah. we can we can kind of keep it that way, almost like a secret recipe. You know, you want to keep it close to the chest and, and not get too many different hands in it. Otherwise, you start to kind of lose what it what it is to begin with. Yeah, so now, how did you get into machining? Like, you're a musician, but in your off time, you're building guns. Like, how does that even happen? Yeah. Oh, I've always had an interest in guns. Um, I've known the Cabot guys since 2013 and yeah. worked with them in various capacities. And within the past like three years, I've been spending more time at the shop, just, you know, get my hands dirty and stuff like that. Uh, when I was young, before I ever hit the road, you know, we're talking like 18, 19, I used to work in a shop. It wasn't quite like, you know, CNT yeah. and stuff like that, but, um, you know, it was like a stamping facility in Michigan. So mm -hmm. stamp out all kinds of like really boring stuff. And um, yeah, I've just always liked working with my hands. You know, okay. even playing music is like playing bass guitar is like working with my hands, you know, building a stage, like problem solving, running into issues and figuring it out, and like, you know, pulling it off. Um, all that stuff is really fun to me. It's like really w rewarding too. So, um, I don't know. It's it's hard to have like a tangible, like, accomplishment when you're on the road. Yeah, you know, we I could say like, that. in fact, like right now, our song that's on the radio is number one on the charts right now, which is cool. But you don't get those daily milestones mm -hmm. where, like, out here, you can say, "I ran this many parts today and fixed that program and made this better," and you can look at all the stuff that you've done. Um, there are a lot of other jobs that have like very slow steady you know like goals and stuff that people aim to reach and you know like hit those accomplishments and then you're on to the next with this i like having something tangible that you can hold and say like hey look what i made yeah 
Yeah, and when so when everything comes in here, like, what is the state of the metal? Like, when you start working with someone, what's something? What's it look like before it becomes a gun? Just uh, raw dimensions. So, a lot of it's like bar stock, you know, stainless steel. We'll cut down, um, square it up, qualify it, rough it out. Um, there's a lot of prep work that goes into it before that material ever even hits the machine. Yeah. And if it's like an artisan Damascus, like, you know, Eggerling or Ballbach or uh, Decker, um, it takes even more time to really prep that material, kind of visualize like where the pattern is in it and how you want it to appear on the gun when it's finished so that you can, you know, take a little bit off of your material, off of your raw material and uh, in the right spots yeah. so that when it goes in the machine, you're getting the result you want and the pattern in the right places. Um, yeah. <laughs> to give you the best likelihood of like not breaking drills and smashing end mills and stuff like that too. So what, what's your favorite part about working at Cabin? Like, what do you like about being here specifically? Cause you could, you know, be doing your rock thing. You could be at another machine shop. I don't know. Hell, you sure. could be in California. Yeah, you know, it, and it's funny, like I, I I, try not to talk about like the whole COVID thing mm -hmm. very much. Um, um, I try not to let that have too much influence in what I do in my daily life. But like during that period of time, like the band was in, unable to tour and I could have easily just taken a year off and like kicked back and done nothing. But I just can't sit around and do that. It's, yeah. it's not my style. I want to be involved in stuff. And um, one of the things that I love about Cabot is I was introduced to the guys at such an early stage in the company that I've seen the development, I've seen the growth. Um, and now I can kind of get my hands in and be a part of that growth. Okay. And like, that's really exciting to me. It's, it's something that I believe in and that I can stand behind. And like everyone wants to be proud of what they do, right? Yep. So like working at Cabot's just a great fit for me because it's a small enough hands-on company to where Every single employee in this building has input, you know? If there's a good idea, it doesn't matter where it comes from, nothing goes unheard, yep. you know? And uh, yep. yeah, and besides that, like, I really enjoy just kind of doing the opposite of what I do on the road. Yeah. You know, I've, I've been touring nonstop since I was 21 years old. And this was like the first year that I've had- Like put to, down roots? Yeah, put down yeah. roots. Um, I literally never unpacked my suitcase. Wow. Until this past year. Huh. Like, just never. I was, you know, like, I'd, I'd go just home lived out of a suitcase and... Two weeks and live out of a suitcase and off somewhere else or visit this person, visit that person. And um, so that was really nice. And, uh, you know, when I'm on the road, I, I run into a lot of people. I talk to a lot of people that I know or that I mm -hmm. don't know. Um, different places pull me in different directions and here it was like I actually got to focus on myself this job the guys here just a handful of people to interact with every single day and kind of get a routine down and it felt great to have a routine nice. it does feel good to have a routine but I'm getting ready to go back out on the road so yeah we're gonna be in DFW I'm gonna come down and see it gas month they'll be there yeah for sure me yeah. and my wife and I don't know maybe we'll bring our kids and just be in the front row, rocking out. DF Dub. DF Dub will be there. Uh, so, all right, let's 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 switch gears to music. So, who's like, who would you say are your top three influences musically? Like, you look at them and go, these are people that I wanted to, I don't know if emulate's the right word, but biggest influences. Sure, that, I mean, there are definitely artists that had, like, that resonated with me when I was younger. And they're still a big part of, like, my foundation mm -hmm. but not necessarily who's influencing me today so um i was like really big into nine inch nails oh yeah typo negative and pantera okay like i was full on like industrial and a metalhead and uh you know my my taste in music is a little more broad than that now and um, i've got some modern influences and things like that too but like those were the staples that made me like want to throw down when I was a kid. Like, yes, let's do this. Yeah, you know, Nine Inch Nails. Actually, my wife, I met my wife the night that she went to a Nine Inch Nails concert. Like, she no came way. back. Yeah, so I was with some friends, and she, we were mutual friends, and she came back from a concert. And the way we know our anniversary date of meeting is because she had the ticket stub from going to a Nine Inch Nails concert. So that right there, 
Nine Inch Nails is how we measure all of our anniversaries from start to finish. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. We actually got in a fight the first night we met. Not like physical, because, you know, jail and whatnot. Um, it was it was more of a verbal altercation. Is, that, is so, that the only reason it wasn't physical? Because of jail? Well, because of jail and whatnot. You know, it's not it's not good. It's not a, a good thing to do to physically get into a fight with a woman or not. But uh, I've got a uh, oh, dude, there you go. Tattoo right there. So, that's right, yeah. man. Yeah. So that's that that's how we met. So Nine Inch Nails had holds a very very special place on the calendar for us. That's they, cool. I didn't I'm, know I'm, that. I'm sure the band has no idea that they're that impo important to us. But you know, it's good to have that for us. Okay, best, you know, I know you're you're a celebrity in your own right, but best like celebrity meeting. Like what's your best story of meeting someone in the rock industry? The most memorable. That's a tough one. I mean, I mean there have been a lot of people that I've met, like within my genre. Yeah. You know, there, there are very few people that I have not met. Um, I mean... I'd just be as bold to say as like, you know, meeting um, like Kid Rock for the first time. Yeah. I was, oh, what's Kid Rock like? I was very young in my career yeah. when I met him. And he was just like a really, really good dude. I imagine him being be. really calm. Like, yes. you know, he's like all out on stage and he's got a big personality there. I could just imagine him just being chill. Well, he's got a pretty big personality no matter what. But, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I just feel like if I met him, he'd be chill. We, uh, yeah, yeah, he's, he's definitely a chill dude. And, uh, you know, that's, that's blossomed into, you know, thing where like being Michigan boys, like I've known him and hung out with him and around him for, oh, that's cool. you know, 15 plus years now. And, and like, he's just always been a really solid dude. Did like, you introduce him that, to Cabot? Cause I know we've done some stuff with him before my time. Yeah. In fact, that's kind of like the story of me getting linked up with Cabot to begin okay. with. Um, I was playing in Sturgis, South Dakota, doing the bike rally, and Bob Kid Rock was playing the night after us, and uh, I happened to run into Cabot during the day in, uh, like, the machine gun pit, right? Mm -hmm. And I was in the market for, like, a, a really nice heirloom-style 1911 anyway. So, first of all, I'm like, why are these, like, beautiful guns out in this dirty machine gun pit? Yeah. yeah. Um, that so so, so Sturgis off. has like a machine gun area where you can just go shoot automatics or something? Yeah. They and, then, did. and they put Cabot there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they did. I, I think they've moved it now. But um, So I go there every year and, and uh, I ran up into the guys at the Cabot booth and, you know, Mike Heber was there and Rob Yankin. And after talking with them for a while, they shared with me that they had built two guns for Kid Rock where they had custom serial numbers that said, you know, oh, rock, nice. rock this and rock that or, you know, whatever they were, rock 01 or something. And they had shared with me, um, after talking a little bit about, like, why I was there, like, hey, I'm performing tonight and all that. They're like, yeah, we, you know, we built these guns for them and we were hoping to get them to them or in front of them, you know, here, but we really don't have any way to get in touch with them. Like, we don't know anyone in his camp. So did they build the guns for him unbeknownst to him on a whim okay yeah on All a right. whim. and i said that's well, a bold move cotton it's a very bold move <laughs> and i think it paid off yeah him. so uh i said well i can help with that and uh i put them in touch they had dinner he saw the guns that they had built for him he said yeah i, I don't want those but i want these can you build me some of these yeah and so they did, and, uh, you know, he did some photo shoots with them and all that. And, um, there have been a lot of photos of him with those with guns. With the cabins, yeah. So that was kind of cool, you know, to be able to, like... Make that connection. Make the connection and do them a solid, introduce them to, to Kid Rock and all that. And, uh, and, yeah, I stayed in touch with the guys since, obviously, and now I'm here. There you go. Cranking out guns for them. Nice. So. Well, yeah. So I, I haven't met a lot of rock stars. Like my first concert though was Corn. Like that's the first concert I ever went to. Great concert. There was a little crazy down in the pit, but you know, it was a definitely a good time. But I did meet Dave Grohl when I was down in Mexico. I was in, uh, I don't know, at the tip of Baja. I'm in the pool, like the, at this resort, okay? And I swim up to the pool bar and I sit down on the little pool bar deal and I order a drink and I turn to my left, it's Dave Grohl. 
just sitting there chilling hanging out and uh, the bartender it's actually you know he's a, a american guy the bartender or no the american the bartender was an american there's another old dude sitting on the other side of dave girl and the old dude was pretty lit okay and he turns over to dave and he goes oh hey what are you guys doing down here and he's like oh well, i'm on vacation with friends he goes oh great what do you do for work and dave turns to me and says oh, i'm a musician and the other guy goes oh man that's a tough line of work how you know that's hard to make money he goes how long you been in it and uh, dave is very very polite and he turns to him and he says i've been doing this you know for 30 years 20 some odd years whatever the number was and the guy gets super impressed and he goes oh my gosh if you've been doing it for that long you must have figured out a way to make money he goes let me give you a tip what you got to do tip. let me give you a tip he goes what you got to do dave, well he didn't ask the guy's name but he's telling dave Grohl, what you got to do is take your music and you make a music video and you put it on YouTube. My grandson made a music video, put it on YouTube. He had 17,000 views. And Dave's just sitting there, he goes, man, that's a really good idea. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then the old guy walks off or, you know, swims off and he had no idea who he was telling how to run his music career. So that's amazing. Yeah, I turned and looked at it and I was like, Dave, that was very polite of you and very kind to, to take that guy's, uh, that guy's advice. He goes, hey, it's great advice. Maybe I'll go put another video up on YouTube. Yeah. So I invite, it was my birthday and I invited Dave to my birthday party. He said he was going to show up and he didn't. He didn't show up? He didn't show up. So my, my. Damn it, Dave. My, uh, you know, my, I was looking at him up here and then I invited him to my birthday party and he didn't show up. And so I was down here. If you told him there would have been barbecue, I bet he would have showed up. Well, I saw him the next day at the pool. Again, I was like, hey, Dave, last night was my birthday party. You said you were going to come to my birthday party and you didn't show up. And he goes, well, tonight, meet me here at this bar. I was like, okay. I went to that bar. I couldn't find him. He wasn't there. So, Dave, if you're out there, I, I love you, but you stood me up twice. I think we're over. It's done. But it's done. It's a done deal. So, I mean, we're machining, like working with metal, working with, you know, tools and guns, like how long you want to do that for? Like, is this like a long-term thing or is it just like, like interim? How's this, how's this fit in with the mat timeline? Well, it's a good way for me to decompress when I'm not touring. No. Um, you know, I, I always, I'm always working with my hands anyway. Like I build motorcycles and stuff and you know, just, I've always got projects, so yeah. it's nice to have like something that I can do that I feel like is an ongoing project and, uh, you know, be able to have a little bit of revenue when I'm off the road too. Like that's there you go. It's great. Like something you don't think about. Do what you love and make a little bit, bit of money doing it, yeah. pay your bills. And I don't know. I, I don't know what the future holds for myself or Cabot or the gun industry. Yeah. as a whole but um do it the best i can for as long as i can you know that's nice. the goal yeah all right let's talk let's switch over to guns in general not just cabot okay top five like you know grail guns what do you have to have grail guns yeah the grail guns i oh, mean I, and let's you know we'll just take away the whole full auto thing so i know everyone's like oh i want to get a full auto mp5 fully transferable yada 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 like outside of that what's the top five you got to have in your armory I don't have much left to add to that list. Okay, so what do you have that's already in your top five? Because it, it could be ones that you already own. Okay. Let's make that caveat. Uh, one that I don't have yet is a 1919. Okay. Like I want belt fed 1919. That's that's on the list. Um, you know, it's funny, like as I've gotten older too, you know, when I was young, I started buying guns as like a shooter and a collector kind yeah. of. Like, man, I really like this. I really want to have one of these. I want to have one of those. And as I've gotten older and actually done some proper training, um, I'm way less of a collector now. Mm -hmm. Like I like having guns. Like I think they're a great investment. I love shooting them. Um, but when it comes down to it, I've got to have, you know, certain guns that are my go-to. Well, I think that's normal. Cause like my collection, it ballooned for a little while. And then it kind of like my personal collection shrinks down as you, you realize like what you want, what you're going to be proficient with. So I don't need 27 different handguns. I only need a couple of handguns that I'm really, really good with. And then rifle wise for my use collection, 
you know, you got your long AR, you got your short AR, same thing on the AK side, some, some long bolt guns. I mean, I got one shotgun, but I don't, I could care less about shotguns. Yeah. I mean, shotguns do have their place, uh, but if you're not doing a lot of hunting, like, yeah, there are some really good options for home defense and stuff too, but like, yeah, they're, I'm not a big shotgun guy. I have one shotgun. It's a Remington 1100 that my grandfather left me outside of that. I mean, I'll get like an 870 because if you ask somebody to go hunting, what's the best shotgun for hunting? They'll always say an 870. Are you hunting ducks? 870. Geese? 870. Rabbits? Well, maybe not 870 for a rabbit. I just blow them up, but you know, turkeys. Yeah, I went down the Mossberg path, so like uh, okay. all my shotguns are like Mossberg variants. Um, and I like them. I, I really love shooting them. I just don't do it enough. Uh, you know, I've got a couple of carry pistols that I go back and forth between. And like, I've got two AR platforms that are my go-tos. One of them, one is a 300 blackout suppressed, mm -hmm. of course. And the other is, you know, uh, Barrett Rex 7 yep. suppressed, you know. What can, what's your go-to can? OSS. Ah, yep. The OSS, the flow through technology. OSS. Yeah. Yep. I haven't gotten one of those yet. I'm, I'm all, see the thing for me is once you go heavy into, you know, muzzle devices, I kind of want to stay there because I like to change my suppressors off. I've got the Sandman, the Sandman K, I've got a Nomad coming. So I like to be able to switch back and forth, but I might have to switch, switch brands. I guess it'd be kind of genres and get into that ASR muzzle break and yeah do the do the oss because my bolt carrier group just gets so dirty yep you know it's dirty i i've got one of those you know vented charge handles and I, the, my main go-to rifles are type a from michigan and uh i don't know if uh we talked about them but you hadn't heard of them yet right yeah so got to get you in touch with those guys okay. awesome awesome guns but still you know even suppressed even with everything they have there's still just a ton of carbon a ton of stuff coming back through so yeah i gotta try that oss yeah, definitely. I, I like good, reliable gear, you know, that you get it dialed in, you don't mess with it, you get the best of the best, put it together, and you know it's going to work every time. Yeah. Like, your daily stuff should be that way. And um, honestly, before I add more guns to my collection, like, I'm going to dive back into uh, more of the night vision stuff. Because oh, it's like, I mean. Okay. Do you have any PBS 14s yet? Is that what you're going for? That's what I'm going for. All right. Yep. And, yeah, uh, right now the pricing, I've just watched the pricing on like, you know, the the green, not the white phosphor, but the green PVS 14s, like depending on where you're getting them from, coming down significantly. I mean, not right now with the pandemic, but prior to the panic buying, you could get a pretty good set of tubes for, you know, eight grand for yeah. for binos. Yeah, so. it's good. Usually it's, you know, 5,000 and I. Yeah. So yeah, one of my buddies and mentors like kind of brought that up to me too. He's like, cause I, I talked to him about buying a few different things and yeah. like, you know, I'm really thinking about, you know, this kind of rifle for that. And he's like, you know what? Do you have how, night vision yet? How many of your rifles are 24 hour rifles? And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah. He's like, well, how many of them can you shoot 24 hours of it out of the day? Like, you don't want to be limited none. by darkness, yeah. you know? So until you've got that, you know, you shouldn't really waste money on new gadgets and things um damn and you know, I, I, feel, I feel dumb now because i like now that's what i want to do but i just you know i've got my ffl and my sot so stuff comes up and you don't have to think about the wait time because it's going to get shipped to your door so i saw a tommy built g36 clone i'm like that's awesome i'm on a real hk kick right now and you can't get an authentic g36 so i saw that come up i clicked buy but now i'm sitting here going that could have gone towards one of my tubes yeah that's all right there you go there's always more money. Still time. Yeah. Um, Who told you that, though, by the way? Who, I'm curious. James Yeager. Yeager. I knew it was Yeager. Yeah. Yeah. Words of wisdom out of that guy every time. Words so. of wisdom. For, words of wisdom from James, Ye James Yeager. I love it. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got my, uh, like, my go-to rifles. Got my Pat Piall and everything mm -hmm. up on it, ready to go. I just got to get some nods and or, you know, uh, a mon monocular is what he... Uh, you're gonna start he off with one, with. yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's gonna bring the cost down significantly. I mean, the, I mean, the bridges aren't that much, but getting starting with one eye. Yeah, 
you know, and he's he's kind of walked me through. I haven't done like a full like night vision course with him or anything like that because I don't have the gear yet. Yeah. Um, but he he walked me through the basics of it. Um, we do some private training and stuff here and there, and was showing me the benefits of a monocular. You know how your eyes will converge your red dot with what you're seeing out of your left eye and all that kind of stuff. And so you know, so taking your red dot over your you know your right eye is looking through your red dot, and then you put your your night vision on your left eye yeah so that when they converge and they do the convergence thing you still have night vision you just don't have as much field of view exactly yeah i get that yeah that's kind of a good idea yeah sweet man so uh all right last question which one's better nine millimeter or 45 what platform <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. 1911? Single stack 1911. 45 or 9 millimeters. I, I, you know what? I like 45 and single stack 1911 steel frame, but there's something to be said for shooting 9 millimeter in that heavy ass gun. Yeah. It's super pleasant. Uh, you know what? It's, if you can get a 9 mil that runs well, which mm -hmm. Cabot has really, really good results in 9 millimeters. Yep. Um, some of the like rest tractor technology that Rob Shawlin developed, um, it's it's becoming more and more reliable than it ever has been uh, for the platform. I really do like shooting nine mil because one, you get a little bit more capacity. Two, recoil management is better, so follow up shots are you're going to be back on target faster. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for nine mil, especially with you know the way that ballistics have progressed over the years. Oh yeah. There's not much difference between getting hit with a 45 versus a 9 mil. Well, yeah, I mean, when you talk about muzzle energy, depending on where you're going to be at speed and bullet weight rise wise, you know, your muzzle energy can actually come pretty close. You're running some plus P. I had a guy call me about plus P plus. He's running some, you know, 90 grain, 9 millimeter, 1500 feet per second. Like, I, I gotta run this ammo. I'm like, Dude, you just got to scream it like it's 45. Like, yeah. I mean, most cases where you're using a pistol, it's going to be different. You're going to be away. Yeah. So, I'm not terribly worried about that. I'd, I'd take more ammo. Take more ammo versus the, the extra velocity. Uh, more words from James Yeager. No one ever gets through a gunfight and at the end of the day, man, I wish I had, to, had so much ammo on. Yeah. I can, I can get that. I wish I wouldn't carry so much ammo. I wish I had less ammo. I wish I had that ammo. Never the case. Great. Well, hey, thanks for taking some time out of the, the busy shop schedule. Like things are crazy right now, and I'm we're better. talking, and you know, hopefully, some people got to got to know you better. And I, I'm privileged to get to call you a friend. It's been pretty cool to I feel the same way to, to get to know you over the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you guys ever get to meet Matt, hands down, one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Oh, so thank you. He's, he's the guy. So thanks a lot, and thanks guys for watching.